This is what Samuel asked me to, to, to read out. I always knew riding to be a hard slog. Living in a wheelchair and with paralysis, I just added metal to my character. Poetry is a facet of creativity that exists everywhere. If I had barriers, then there are more walls to write upon. My ghost stories are now featured in Overland, Westerly, The Griffith Review and The Chicago Review. The fiction I submitted 20 years ago was typically bad. That's why I switched to poetry. I just needed to grow. Regards, Samuel Watson. No, and being disabled, conceived and read by Samuel Watson. A broken writer is a broken writer, 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 is a broken writer. He's a broken writer, 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 he's a broken writer. A broken writer is a post. The crooked man, dedicated to the memory of my late father. My dad straightened out the crooked man in the old laundry shed. Above the fishing gear and jars of nuts and bolts were on a rack. Their naked, twisted forms did hang from the neck. Body hair like pine needles, restrained by welded G clamps and steel trap teeth, hydraulic arms and pulleys, and a shiny drip tray on the floor to catch the expelled blackened hate. Sometimes eight, sometimes ten, the crooked men with faces like prunes, tattoos and scars, and tongues that could no longer work, but engulfed by obscenities as they leaked night and day in that old laundry shed. And they were not grateful or ungrateful to crooked men, nor were they indebted to my father in his amazing wrath. In these days, when the hay would trickle through our backyard haven, drowning the smells of Saturday afternoon and freshly cut grass and the yap of the Labrador, and innocence lost to the crooked men. A one ended born. A quote from Leonardo da Vinci. For once you have tasted flight, you will walk the earth with your eyes turn skywards, for there you have been, and there you will long to return. A one-ended born. An hourglass constricted, the whore inside of me who is watching the clock, monitoring the time, this wasted time to get off. Get going, lunar cycle gauge of tide and meridian. How I can hear the sand slip downward in my body clock. I need to be here, could be there, and not long ago the only place you wanted to be was by my side. Maybe. I am a pencil that cannot sharpen. Ink that slides off paper. Outside of our time, I am lost. A one ended born. Thank you so much. Um, okay, 
there now is our panel, The Last Poets, to close down the day. Um, I'm glad you got to hear a little bit of Samuel's work. He's a great and powerful writer, and uh, he worked hard to, to do those pieces for us. gestate over uh, years, even decades, these ideas that you don't even consciously know you're having, they revisit like a kind of orbiting thing. And one day the orbit will coincide with some kind of happenstance 
in the world, in your life, and you go, bang, your time has come. And you actually come to realisation, yeah, I've actually been thinking about that for years without actually consciously knowing it. And it, it's this sort of thing comes to fruition and, and you try and find the ideal way to channel that, uh, try and find the form, the structure, the words. Is it comic? Is it serious? Is it satirical? Is it, is it, is it, yeah, form is, um, I find form a difficult thing. Uh, I think Auden said something like, once he found the form of a poem, it was relatively easy to write. Um, not easy, but relatively easy, because you can have a mass of words, this, this uh, great swirling chunk of things, you know, well, what is it? Is it free verse? Is it, is it, does it need to be constrained? Does, does it rhyme? Um, you got to play with it and find its form, and I think once you get a, a structure and a form, that helps kind of nail the custard down. But it does have to be a poem. Uh, it doesn't have to be. Um, I have been frustrated with labels all my life. Um, I suppose a lot of what I write is poetry, but it could be seen to be prose or poetic prose or comic squibs or paragraphs or, you know, it's like um, snippets of short story that sometimes, I guess, often have a compression to the language. So unlike... Yeah. Um, a prose writer, a short story writer, a novelist, who, if they're trained in that trade, it will just, you know, sweep across the page. I think, I think if you're writing in a shorter form, even in prose, then you tend to really compact and focus and make every word kind of count and, and do some driving and do some work. So you can write prose, but can have a very uh, compact, intense, poetic form. You know, and some of what I write, I think, is is in that category, micro uh, fiction. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. no, fuck that. No. <laughs> Categories. Yeah, probably. Isn't it? Micro is too small. So it's, it's not you macro, it's not micro. Okay. You write songs as well. I write songs as well. Um, Facebook dogger is your speciality, isn't it? Yeah, you know, dogger. You're a musician as well. You're yeah. yeah. Come on, what else am I? <laughs> but someone else should speak. Oh, I was sort of feeling like we should just have a big circle rather than the audience there on the stage here, considering the number of people and the interaction that occurs. Um, yeah, exactly, a little campfire. Um, well, I mean, I was just thinking about you know the external um, labeling of writing as a particular this or that. Um, I mean, I just enjoy the dual process of dipping into my subconscious through the stream of consciousness, um, uh, uh, I guess, experience with writing and finding things out about myself that I didn't know were there, or um, you know, discovering uh, thoughts or opinions or ideas. But then the other process of carving, you know, so once you've got the, the raw clay, the vomit that you kind of just want for however long about your grandfather playing guitar or whatever it is, um, then it's the the actual wiggling away of all the unnecessary stuff because that to me becomes the artwork you know because i think that you can just give a notebook and a pen to anyway and someone put an instrumental track and you're just going to write and anybody can just vomit onto the page but it's actually having the courage to go and clean up the vomit find the chunks that are still edible and then remold oh, man, those. You're as well, man. <laughs> remold those and feed those to other people and call it poetry and you know put a bit of a bit of craft. Uh, a bit of craft. craft. Yeah, exactly. Craft, yes. but it's also, you know, it's um, espresso shot versus weak, um, you know. Latte. Yeah, an espresso. Um, <laughs> yeah, and um, I don't know, that, 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 for me, that poetry is also immediate. Um, you're not waiting years and years before you have a product. And you can also take direct relationships with your audience. Whereas with a novel, you really have to like let them read it for however long it takes, and then get some feedback from them. But you know, with a poem, you can actually just be in any group of people and say it, and the result and the interaction and the delivery is all embedded within the art form. 
Um, whereas you just don't get that with long form journalism or any other way that doesn't have direct uh, interaction with your audience. So. Do you want to weigh in on that, Kim? Yeah, I probably have a couple of reasons for writing and for writing poetry specifically. The first is it was a way to deal with stress and personal trauma and it just happened. So there wasn't a strategy or a plan or any grand sort of um, outcome that I was looking for. I was just writing because that was what was happening. And it was a way to channel negative energy, positive energy, everything that was going on inside and everything from challenges. So that's always been there from being a child and it's gone from writing on a page to the spoken word to typing it on my phone to creating movies with it to finding all these different sort of ways of fusing art but ultimately it's still about writing to deal with personal things going on. And my second reason is more around creating impact and you touched upon it a little bit about the connection with audience but I have this desire, like a burning passion, to create impact with poetry, to get a message across, or something that I'm deeply passionate about, or something that I really want to drive change around, whether it's anti-bullying strategies, whether it's raising domestic violence awareness, whether it's helping youths in an underprivileged area to understand that there are different pathways they can take, and that's okay. And poetry has this beautiful way of being accessible and creating very quick attention, especially with youths. I do a lot of work with underprivileged youths, and it's just a different way for them to listen in little bursts of information. It, it is quite creative, and your brain goes to a different place. So I, I purposely now use it to create this ripple effect on a message or something that I really want to um, drive major change around. So it's quite intentional now, I, I guess. Maybe this one's working. Is that working? Yeah. Um, why poetry? I was one of those people who spent my whole life saying, I hate poetry, I didn't understand it, I didn't, it wasn't written for me and I didn't, I didn't get it in school at all. And so, um, for most of my adult life, I was that person, I hate poetry and my eyes would glaze over. And, um, and then, one day, inexplicably, in a bookshop in the Blue Mountains, I stumbled on uh, a second-hand book called Eight American Poets. And it's the first, I guess, the first poetry collection I'd looked at since I'd been in school. And it absolutely blew my mind wide open. There was a poem in there by John Berryman uh, called Life, Friends, is Boring, You Must Not Say So. I mean, it just still gives me goosebumps to this day that you could write that your life was boring and all of those topics were, you know, pretty much everything I was feeling, I guess, at the time. So that collection was full of, um, the, well, there were eight of them, confessional poets, as they were referred to, Anne Sexton, um, Elizabeth Bishop, and Robert Lowell. And I just, I was absolutely in heaven. But I was a prose writer at the time, and I'd, I published a memoir. And, and after reading some of that poetry, I just started to write short things, but I didn't, because I'd spent so many years saying how much I hated poetry, I didn't feel I could then sort of, you know, claim to be a poet, so I, I was writing short things. But what I loved about writing these short things was that they were so, you could get to the emotion of the story very, very quickly. So you didn't need um, a, a beginning, a middle and an end. Uh, a poem could be a moment within an experience. And that might be the moment that you're sitting at your father's bedside as he dies, for example. You don't need the whole story. We can just talk about the, the raw emotion of a single moment. So I just started writing um, short things and, and I guess I realised that they were actually classified as poems, whatever that may be. And, and I don't really want to write anything else, so I've been doing that for four or five years. And yeah, I, that's what I do, that's what I love to do. Thanks, Ali. Brad, did you want to add anything? Um, sure. um, yeah, I'm just really interested because yeah. each person you hear, oh yeah, that's true, oh no, that's right. And, <laughs> and all those different kind of facets that would come into it. Um, I think I relate poetry a lot to, uh, to journalism uh, as well as to music. Uh, 
and that has been my own sort of lifetime background interests. And in a way, I can kind of see when I was a kid listening to like Elton John and Bernie Taupin records and T Rex's Electric Warrior and David Bowie and all, all these people. And then by the time I was at uni, in a bit more of a developed way, like Bill Scott Heron and John Cooper Clark and people like that. But just right through growing up, like there's always this sort of sense almost a put down around poetry that it was pretentious or that it was dead. But in actual fact, we've never lived in such a poetry saturated time, you know, like if you want to use the obvious example like Bob Dylan or people like Leonard Cohen or Bowie, oh. or I mentioned or Lou Reed, like the lyricists bring the the people into the, yeah, okay, you pop, we'll add him in, I'll put him on the board. Um, but the, 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 well, anyway, what I'm saying is, you know, that the, the, all these people are, are there communicating to us and, and richly a part of their lives with their music, of course, but their lyrics as well. You know, like, yeah, Lust for Life or, you know, whatever it may be. So many things. Or do whatever. We'll be doing <laughs> no, one well, of those albums soon. Like YouTube, YouTube. But, I mean, I've just had YouTube as well for young people to hear, yeah. like, button poetry, millions and millions of people yeah. watching poets on videos. Yeah. You know, it is quite phenomenal because... Well, well yeah, that's really interesting because this conversation around shrinking attention spans, well, mm -hmm. whilst the side of that is true, I watched my 13 and, well, he would have been 16 then, year old sons, sit down and watch a show like No Jumper, which is an hour and 15 minutes of, you know, two, three, four guys in the hip-hop community, quite mm -hmm. underground, others very major or who become major, and they are doing nothing but sitting around at a crap ass wooden table with crap ass microphones mm -hmm. nailed to the ground and they all they are doing is sitting there drinking beers, smoking joints and talking about their music and their, their lyrics. Mm -hmm. And they will watch that for an hour to an hour and a half solid. Mm -hmm. And they won't just watch one either, they'll watch a bunch of it's because they're obsessed with that culture. But I mean that gets into the whole sort of interconnection between music and, and words and poetry itself. So I think it's just been in the atmosphere and for me I think that slept inside of me and then when I went through big changes in my life I, I began to I've always written but I really began to, to to do it obsessively and it's almost been like a um, a lifesaver for me actually if I'm really honest about it and uh, and just a great way to like I was talking about too a great way to communicate to to, to, to find pleasure and energy and when I say journalism it's like inner and outer journalism into who your who what your being is inside yourself, but it's no good having that without the observed world with it. You know, so you want you kind of want this loop occurring. So you've got the the observations as well as the other sort of strange chemical nature of things that are your kind of existential self. You know, so somewhere in all that, poetry is this kind of electrical thing. You know, that, that allows you to go back into the world and other people, if they don't understand it, they, they can feel it, you know? Like that's the thing, so feeling is important too, not just feeling, but it, you, you can communicate on not just the rational level, but some sort of sub-rational level that, that is, you know, if you want to get, it can be quite mystical, I think. Or just hanging out with your friends, a poem allows the whole community to go, oh, we're going down <coughs> into that deepest part of ourselves and we're connecting because we're all going through difficult moments in our lives at various times. And we don't get the opportunity to kind of acknowledge that collectively often enough. Um, it's, it's interesting because I cry in films and, I, and um, you know, you go to such a deep emotional level watching a character go through whatever they're going through. And to be able to see the faces of people in the room when you're doing that is quite a powerful thing. And the other thing that I think about as well, and particularly for me and people of colour, is we are invisible on television, radio, magazines, most media. And so it's almost the opposite of invisibility because when we do see a character that's a person of colour, it is often stereotype, caricature, or somehow derogatory. So you've got the low self-esteem being reinforced as well. So if you don't find opportunities yourself to take the microphone and say, hey, this is the real human being that you might have heard a statistic about, um, then you continue to just exist in that, you know, 
ethereal plane of invisibility and derogatory um, you know, uh, um, uh, representations of yourself. Um, and it's quite frustrating. So I found within the spoken word community, is people like, oh, I've got a microphone, I've got an audience, people are listening to me, they will know who I am. And so that sense of empowerment that comes with a supportive, safe environment that says, whatever you're going through, we'll be here, we'll listen, and if you cry, we, we say that that's okay. Um, I feel like that, that is, you know, it's weird because of so many writers go, well, I'm an introvert, so I'm just gonna, you know, take this course of staying in my room. But one day, you're gonna publish a book, and if you do that, then your publicist is gonna go, get out there, speak to people. You know, I'm not gonna hold your hand, and then you will have to face your audience. And I don't know, I mean, I think, yeah, that, that coming together of, our depth, our, our, our collective depth, is something that we don't get enough of because we don't have campfires anymore. Yeah. Thanks, Miles. Did anyone else want to weigh in on that? I've got another. Tell me, trying to say something? Oh, I know. Yes, Just in terms of um, poetry's therapy, my husband made a comment the other night about um, the very personal things that people post on Facebook, and I said, oh my god. I would never ever post anything personal on Facebook. And then I realized that I, I, anytime I share my poems, they're all about deeply, deeply personal things. 